It was the African leader Kwame Nkrumah in his book, Imper Neocolonialism, the last stage of imperialism. Uh, I think, uh, you, you know, that's a big play of what is happening at the moment. But again, as analysts across the continent have, uh, you know, analyzed, do you put the blame on the African leaders for lack of, you know, uh, initiative and vision, or you put it on their past colonial masters? Neocolonialism is still what we're discussing here on VSA. So welcome, M. Suleiman. Neocolonialism has actually taken, you know, different forms and shapes. Uh, it is the many foreign companies on African soils ripping nations apart, giving them crumbs in return. It is the aids that uh, come in, sometimes without request. It is the debt profile that rises by the day with no viable proof of ability to repay. Yet, it's not free. Neocolonialism comes in the form of control over government policy as uh, is existing among Francophone countries in West and Central Africa. Sometimes it's the restitution of artworks to create a good image of support, but in reality it is to get closer to those resources. It comes in military support and its legitimacy. It is controlling a uh, nation's finances through lifelong agreements that are enslaving, harsh, and totally domineering. Africa has had to deal with itself and the neocolonialism tendencies of the foreign powers of the world. And that, that has been the conversation. Joining me uh, here on VSA is Olufemi Lawson. He's the executive director of the Center for Public Accountability. Uh, pretty much later, uh, Gido Joe will join me. Well, good to have you, uh, Lawson, on the show. Good evening, Suleiman. Uh, always a, a delight to see you. Uh, you know, as far back as uh, 65 as highlighted uh, in my opening, uh, you know, uh, Kwame Nkrumah wrote on neocolonialism. It's been decades ago and uh, the same problems exist. What's the reason behind this? Well, fundamentally, I think uh, we are where we have to be. And uh, Africa has continued to discuss issues of neocolonialism as a matter on the front today because of our inability as Africans, in my own opinion, to liberate ourselves, even when granted independence by the colonial authorities. It is very unfortunate that decades after so many African countries have been granted you know, independent by the colonial authorities, ideologically, the countries of Africa, as exemplified by its leadership over the decades, have been unable to liberate itself. And today, we have a country that is more or less, you know, worse than what it has always been, you know, before we were colonized, you know, and even immediately after independence. Unfortunately, the question of neocolonialism is prevalent today because this, the continent of Africa has refused, because of the question of leadership, to live you know, above you know, the pre-colonial areas. You know, leadership is key here, as highlighted uh, by you. But the thing here is that we've had leaders in times past like Kwame Nkrumah who saw the need for every African leader to rise above board and crush neocolonialism, but that hasn't been. Not, not only, you know, the way of the likes of Kwame Nkrumah, you must remember, you know, the role played by people like Thomas Sankara, you know, and not only political leaders, but other you know, civil rights movement, you know, personalities within the continent who are at the forefront of the vanguard for Pan-Africanism, who are at the forefront of the vanguard for a true, you know, African 
you know, culture of governance, but what ended, you know, their reign? The colonial authorities with active connivance, you know, with the, you know, the local colonial surrogates ensured that these ideologies were not entrenched, ensured that these ideologies were not, you know, allowed to be, you know, impacted on the generation of Africans that were coming in the post-colonial and, you know, they succeeded in, you know, exterminating them. And today, Africa is as worse as we have been during the colonial era. And, in this, you know, the moment we thought, you know, these countries were independent and we can begin, you know, to have a continent, you know, that is post-colonial, we began to experience a continent that has gone far backward, you know, the era of colonialism, and it's very, very sad. You know, uh, some analysts on the square had, uh, you know, talked about, I can see uh, that uh, my, uh, uh, we're not being joined also by Jideo Ojo. Jideo Ojo, good to see you and uh, welcome to the show. Uh, it was a pleasure. Yeah, let, let me quickly uh, get I'll get back to you. Let me uh, uh, continue where I left off with uh, uh, Lawson. You know, uh, Lawson, there are schools of thought that believe if Africa was united, uh, the continent would discourage the penetration of the power blocks. Uh, what should African governments be doing at this point in time to bring about the much talked about African unity? Every effort at you no know, promoting African unity, every agenda at entrenching the spirit of solidarity and pan Africanism has been thwarted, you know, by the colonial authorities who are today's imperialists, you know, who despite granting independence, so some of these African nations, be the, in the Francophone or the Anglophone, have continued to determine the fate of the continent. And until the African continent realizes that it is not yet independent. Independence must not be reduced to the privilege of having to fly your national flag or singing your national anthem. Because that has been how limited the understanding of most African countries have become today until we realize that the contest of independence actually entails our ability you know, to be independent ideologically, to be independent in the, you know, in the true sense of power of criticism, we may not be able to you know, discover ourselves and the, you know, the real contest of Pan-Africanism as, you know, you know, as you know, preached by the likes of Kwame Nkrumah, the Thomas Kanto and Kara, you know, and every other Pan-Africanist may not come to realization. The first thing the African continent must do today is to realize that we are independent, not just politically or economically, but ideologically. Uh, let me uh, come uh, to you, uh, uh, Jide. You, you know, listening to, uh, you know, Olufemi and uh, many other African analysts uh, who have uh, been following the debate on neocolonialism, what would you say uh, is the sore point uh, for African nations uh, to rally around and uh, start working on? Uh, thanks for the opportunity. I think uh, for me, uh, issue with um, colonialism and neocolonialism uh, stems from the mismanagement of uh, uh, the colonization uh, period of Africa, which is in the 60s, um, 50s, late 50s, and early 60s. That was when you have majority of the 54 African countries uh, getting their independence from, from the white supremacists. So you now find that, that at that time when uh, people like Nkuma and uh, Mama Gaddafi and, and um, Thomas Ankara and, and the likes, uh, Julius Nyerere, were actually advocating for uh, United States of Africa. <clears throat> Many others were of the opinion that this has to be gradual and that uh, any attempt to 
to have this uh, uh, United States um, may, may result in uh, uh, maybe counterproductive. However, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, I would say the two camps were right. Uh, even though uh, trying to uh, foster a United States of Africa has been a mirage, uh, given the fact that uh, you know the multi-ethnic, multi-religious nature of African countries uh, does not support a United States of Africa. Um, but even if we leave that on the side and talk uh, stricto sensu about how individual African countries have, have, fear, have fared, how they have fared uh, since the colonization period. You find out that um, we are to blame. We are to blame. Uh, I mean, each country's leadership is to blame for our uh, neocolonialism, as it were. Because if you look at um, what we lash on to after our decolonization, we lash on to Western culture. We lash on to Western music, Western films, Western dress, mood of dressing, uh, even Western language. How can we break free when our language, our menu, our music, our everything about us, including our dressing, dress code, have to conform to the Western world's ideological and leaning? So, while we were independent from Britain in 1960, we were not culturally independent. In fact, that was when we now went a while lashing on to pop culture, music, our indigenous music, we started uh, you know, distancing ourselves from it. Our religion has no uh, value to us again. Our our, even our politics, our way of playing politics, our, way of our economy is largely dependent on the Western world. So this is what has been the aftermath of uh, uh, the colonization era in many of the African countries. Only very few countries uh, were able to actually break free of uh, this colonial mentality, which uh, fellow Nicola Po could sang uh, about colonial mentality, which is still uh, afflicting us today. Because today, our president has gone to where? UK for medical tourism. This is 60 years plus after independence. Our leader still have to go to UK to assess Healthcare services. Does that show seriousness on our part? I don't think the Western world is to blame. We should blame ourselves. We should blame ourselves for not doing the needful to ensure that when we got this independence, we also uh, sever our umbilical cord with the culture, with the Western ways of doing things. Look at China. China today had so close to its culture, to its religion. This was China that Chama Mao helped to gain political victory in 1949. Just 1949, that was when Chama Mao led China into uh, you know, uh, political emancipation. And look at it. They never sacrificed their language. They never sacrificed their, their, their dress code. They never sacrificed their film, their entertainment culture. You can see in the 70s how popular you know, Chinese films are in, in, in Nigeria. The Kung Fu and, and the martial art films that we were watching while growing up. And China is a population of one around 1.3 billion, but never gave up its culture, even its currency, yen. 
the currency of China, it never surrendered it to the US dollar. So if you have to trade with China, you have to trade in yen. And that is what is expected of African leaders. Rather than subjugating their political leadership to Western uh, Western civilization and Western leaders. Let me quickly bring in Olufemi here. You've raised quite a number of issues here. You, the talk of culture, you know, your, your culture, your language, your dressings, and of course, keeping that umbil umbilical cord uh, to your colonial masters. Olufemi, you know, uh, GDA has raised uh, quite a number of things and is also uh, giving a relevant example in. Uh, uh, the Far East, uh, now China as an example. Uh, China presently is also trying to make incursion into Africa, and uh, some say this is another, you know, colonization of uh, a, you know, group of countries that were uh, already colonized and uh, have their independence now. Take us through, you know, the, 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 the process he raised, uh, whereby we had some African leaders who wanted a united union. Or for the continent? Well, fundamentally, we must agree with the fact that, you know, like I said, irrespective of how much more political or economic independence that we claim to have as African continent or as African countries, without an ideological, you know, independence, we may not be able to achieve the dream of those who had envisaged a pan, a, you know, in the United Africa, prosperous Africa, neo-colonial era. The truth is that today, China is not just, you know, on an incursion into Africa. You know, what you are seeing today is a reflection of the fact that most African countries, including Nigeria, have become so lazy, complacent to the extent that they have to invite, you know, you know, patronage from China and some of these other nations in order for them to move forward. Today, it has gotten so bad for a nation that is 61 years independent you know, not to be able to construct 159 kilometers of rail line without inviting a country like China. It tells you that ideologically, we remain retarded, we remain backward, we remain at that point of believing that we don't have the capacity to move forward as a continent. And that is why the, 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 the dream of every, you know, China today, you may call it a communist nation, but it has become an imperialist authority on its own. China is out to make profit by all means. If you look at its approach to businesses, if you look at its approach, you know, to in you know, the foreign relations, and China will not sit back when there are opportunities to exploit Africa and for its arm. Today, our countries are, you know, are the mercy of China because they have become so complacent and lazy. Today, as we speak, the African Union is sitting you know, in a building donated by the Chinese government. What does that tell you? That Africa, despite the enormity of our resources, of our wealth in human, in material, in natural resources, cannot build a seat for the African Union. We have to wait for China to donate that. It tells you that we have invited the second colonial authorities. It is not, China is not to be blamed. What is to be blamed is the inability of the, Af of the African countries to free themselves ideologically, mentally, from, you know, from colonialism. And until we do this, we will continue to remain, not just where we were left, by the colonial authorities, but we may be going backward to the pre-colonial eras. And it's beginning to reflect now. If you look at the fact that now we are inviting countries like China to come and build schools, to come and build universities, universities like the colonial authorities did in 1947, 1948, it's a sad reality, and we must accept this. You know, uh, uh, GD, you know, the, the thing here has uh, to do with uh, whether there is some form of slavery. It might not be physical slavery, it just might be mental slavery. Uh, listening to Lufemi, uh, should we 
uh, hold the African leaders responsible or where does corruption stand in all of this when we talk about uh, the inability of the African leader uh, or leaders to do the right thing? Does this tilt towards corruption? Of course, corruption has a, a lot of role to play. Uh, two years ago, there about uh, President Muhammad Bukhari was made the African champion against corruption by the African Union. And if you look at the staggering statistics of how much uh, Africa lost annually to corruption, you will know that that is our number one problem. Our leaders, rather than bringing useful ideas, developmental ideas, would rather use their ideas to loot, to loot the treasury. Imagine Sonia Abacha was in power for five years. What he singularly stole, what Sonia Abacha stole in those five years, is still being recovered over 20 years after his left power. You, you, today, you hear of Abacha loot, Abacha loot. Look at Mobutu Seseseko. Mobutu Seseseko Benju. Look at uh, uh, Iti Ami in Uganda. Look at Equatorial Guinea. Nkwama Mbasogon, what, what is his name? All, all of these leaders, including, you know, uh, the allegation of corruption, against Austin Mubarak, who led Egypt for 30 years. Look at the issue that led to the Arab Spring some five years ago. Was it not maladministration and corruption that led to those Arab Spring, that led to the unseating of the president of, of, of uh, Tunisia, of the president of uh, Egypt, of the president of uh, Libya? Look at what happened even with Zimbabwe, Uncle Rob, Robert Mugabe. Was he not fingered in corruption? Look at what is going on. Even in South Africa, Thabo Mbeki and uh, Jacob Zuma, how did they end their political journey? Was it not over corruption issue? Look at the altercation between uh, uh, George Weah in Liberia and uh, Ellen Salim Johnson. The allegation of corruption between the two of them. My brother, <laughs> corruption is the bane, is the cocoa, is the gist of our problem in Africa. If only our leaders can make our monies to work for us, why should we be expecting China to come and build African Union building for us in Africa? If it's not corruption, why should our president still be going to Europe for medical tourism? 60 years plus after independence. I mean, Robert Mugabe died in Singapore or somewhere. Say so for Look, look, look at, I mean, Suleiman, look at the, um, this um, Mo Ibrahim Prize for Leadership. For consecutive four or five years, they couldn't get African leaders to give. They couldn't award it until this year. I think it was only last month or there about, after about four or five years of interregnum that they were able to get somebody that they, they could give. And almost all of those who have won it are from Southern Africa. You know, you say... The Judy, Botswana's you know, of this world. You know, Judy, I, I feel you, and I'm sure a lot of Africans watching across the continent also feel your, you know, uh, your pain, analyzing, you know, giving names of so many African leaders. Uh, now, all of them, you see, we have to look pretty much more inwardly uh, going from, uh, you know, what uh, the submission we got from uh, GD now, it's all about corruption. Africa is not in want of uh, uh, human and material resources. There's an abundance of everything here on the continent. But managing them and the thievery of these, uh, you know, resources uh, to outside the continent is what uh, is uh, 
uh, placed the continent uh, really uh, on <laughs> what you call life support. So tell us how much of, you know, looking inwards uh, the continent can do to get it going? Well, most importantly, the potentials are there, the natural resources are there, human resources are there. Today, all over the world, in Europe, in Asia, in America, Africans are making exploits. Africans have, you know, been noticed for grand, you know, breaking interventions, innovations. It tells you that we do not actually need to look at world as Africans before being able you know, to rescue this continent. What is required is leadership. But leadership does not drop from everyone. I keep insisting on this. Our people have a role to play. It is very, very unfortunate that a lot of time we welcome to platforms like this, sit back and blame leadership. We forget the role played by the followers in ensuring the emergence of these leaders. The truth remains that Africans must arise. We must not continue to wait for the Messiah. A lot of countries have waited for the Messiah. A lot of countries have waited for one leader or the other that will turn things around while going back to sleep. And what has been the result? Tragedy. Today, as we speak, Nigeria is in a situation that is in dire need of leadership. Because in 2015, a lot of us were of the illusion that electing a strong man will provide the way out. And that tells us that followership, the citizenry, must now arise to play a fundamental role in determining the future of the continent. It is not enough for us to begin to elect strong leaders or credible leaders in code. We must begin to demand as Africans for institutionalization of our aspirations. Africans not, know what they want. Our people know what they want, but how do they achieve it? It is not going to be at elections any longer. It has been proven that elections have not been able to provide the kind of leaders that Africans desire. That is why it must be a consistent and continuous effort that must engage every citizen towards ensuring that we build institutions that will make leaders to work you know, for the citizens. If we don't build institutions that will make leaders to be responsible and responsive to the aspiration of the citizens, we may have to continue this kind of conversations for the next decades. And I think now is the time for Africans, particularly citizens, to begin to look at how we can build institutions by advocating for restructuring of our institutions across the various countries, by advocating for you know, a review of so many of the laws that are guiding you know, our existence across the countries of Africa. And if we don't do that, we may be able to elect strong leaders, but we may not really be able to get out of the quagmire that we we'll find ourselves. There's a fine place for us uh, to take a moment. Uh, Africans know what they want, and the time for us to rejig the process is now. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Olufemi and Jide here on VSA. Stay with us. Welcome back to VSA here on News Central Television, looking at neocolonialism, which has, uh, you know, increased the rivalry between the great powers of the world. Well, it's like a scramble, uh, listening to analysts from across the continent for the continent and its resources. The dominance over Africa is seen as an important tool towards becoming a global force. The United States, China and Russia are on what's like a three-horse race to have a grip on the continent, yet Africa can be as huge an influence. Military intervention in many of African uh, wars are pre-planned and an attempt to dominate the nations. Now, these countries also give aid, what can be described as a revolving credit, a never-ending one. You know, the absence of neocolonialism can raise living standards in Africa, but is Africa ready? 
Now, we still have our guest here with me, Olufemi and uh, Jide. Uh, good to know both of you still there. Now, let's uh, you know, take this home. Uh, uh, let me start with uh, uh, Jide. How prepared is Africa, you know, looking at the absence of colonial, neocolonialism uh, in, the, in the continent? If that is taken out of the window, do you see Africa as a continent prepared for greatness? Well, uh, I think um, it's a rhetorical question, which um, I may not be able to um, do justice to. Because we have 54 countries in Africa, and um, incidentally, the 54 of them subscribe to a union called African Union. And to the best of my knowledge, African Union has been doing its level best despite shortage of resources, financial resources. Um, African Union has not been able to uh, foster as much this development in Africa as it will have wanted to. But we must not lose sight of one thing. Sulema, we talked earlier on about corruption. Uh, my brother Olufemi talked about leadership. But where is the role of insecurity in Africa? Tell me one country that is an oasis of security in Africa. A lot of internal strife across the African continent. Nigeria is facing its own. Ghana has its own separatist group in northern Ghana. Casamance is troubling them in Senegal. Look at South Sudan that fought to Tanel to get its own independence from Sudan under Omar al-Bashir. Just three years after getting independence in 2011, three years by 2014, Rick Maja and the other guy could not see eye to eye. This was a country they fought hard to get. Look at what is going on, the Tigray region in um, uh, Ethiopia. Look at the strike, the insecurity, the, the, the issue of insurgency, the issue of, uh, you know, famine, the issue of food insecurity that has pushed much of African youth to want to go abroad. Nigerians today contribute significantly to illegal migration to Europe. Why? Because their leaders have let them down because of insecurity, many of them are seeking asylum in, in, in Western countries. Uh, every day is reported in the news of attempts by many African migrants to cross from Libya to Portugal to Italy to, uh, you know, Spain and all of that, risking their lives. If their countries have been living, would they have ventured, look at our unemployment rate in Nigeria, 33%. 33%, 60 years after independence, we could not provide jobs for our Timmy youth. And the youth board is staring us in the face, is constituting security risk. Many are turning to internet scammers, Yahoo, Yahoo, Yahoo Plus. These are the challenges that Africa is still grappling with. Unfortunately, because of debt of resources, African Union has not been able to have its own standing force. We still expect our exploiters, the Western world, to come and provide peace mission in Africa. They are the one funding, uh, uh, is it Amazon or what is it? This African Union peacekeeping mission in Somalia, in, uh, in uh, Eritrea, and all of that. The motion to have um, silencing the gun, silencing the gun has been on the template of African Union for over 10 years. They are still looking at uh, Z2030. 
to silence the gun. If you don't silence the gun and there is continuous insurgency, insecurity, how do you develop? How can you develop your potentials? That's a, that's a big question you just raised there, Jide. Uh, looking at what's uh, going on, uh, let, me, let me bring in Olufemi here. Olufemi, listen to Jide. Uh, one, uh, w let me ask if this uh, truly, the talk about insecurity from, you know, he's painted across the continent isn't actually tied to corruption. For many African youth, uh, all they've known on the continent uh, since Beth has been strife uh, from one part of the continent uh, to the other. Uh, is this also, you know, laced with corrupt, you know, tendencies by these, you know, striving uh, groups? You see, every deep analysis of the current insecurity in every part of Africa can be traced to the meanings of corruption in these countries. Let me cite an example. Today, Nigeria is battling all forms of insurgency, you know, from Boko Haram, we migrated to Nigeria, you know, and the insurgent groups, you know, to what was called, what has been termed the activities of bandits, whom I call terrorists, operating in the northwest flank, now coming towards the south of the country. And the truth is that none of these can be divorced from the minutes of you know, corruption and what corruption has been able to establish. Let me give you an instance. As I speak to you, Zanfara State is a state that is battling, you know, with the activities of these terrorists called bandits today. Zanfara has had governors between 1999 and now who have been so religious, you know, moral or whatever you want to call it, that you would assume that a state like Zamfara should not have issues of insecurity, you know, corruption, and social vices. But today, it's one of the most terrorized states in the country of Nigeria. Why? You have a state where governors earn so much money in the name of the people of Zamfara State, and in Abuja, you know, operate from Abuja, and encourage, you know, criminals to continue, you know, to dictate the fate of their people. I can tell you that until, 20, until 2019, the average person, because I was in Zamfara on a number of occasions, the average person living in Zamfara has never even seen a motorcade of their governor in the state capital because the governor permanently lives in Abuja. Our governors in Nigeria today take huge millions of naira in the name of security goals. Monies that ordinarily are supposed to be used to create employment opportunity for younger people, to create jobs, you know, are being diverted into personal use. You cannot take away the role of corruption in, in, the, in, the, in the insecurity situation in Africa today. In fact, the truth is that if you go deep into the foundation of what we call insecurity in Nigeria today, the real thing that has been used to cast the foundation is corruption. The inability of people to use funds that are meant to create employment to empower the people for the purpose, rather diverting it for personal usages, you know, for, as encouraged restiveness, as encouraged hostilities, as encouraged insecurity. Today, the average Nigerian actually believes that it is more beneficial to take up arms and, and you know, kidnap people and terrorize them rather than you know getting jobs that is not actually available anyway. So the role of corruption in the whole of the question of insecurity cannot be overemphasized. And the truth is this, if we are going to address the question of insecurity, that is gradually sweeping the freedom of the average African today away, we must look at the role that corruption is playing in this. Today, we have had revelations of how people have taken billions of dollars that are meant for the procurement of arms and ammunition to tackle insurgencies to personal use. Only a few days ago, the National Security Advisor in Nigeria you know, alluded to the fact that monies that were allocated you know, for the purchase you know, of you know, military equipment have been diverted in the last couple of years. This money, you know, we read that the Chief of Army Staff in Nigeria 
also alluded to the fact that the 2.6 trillion naira that have so far been spent, you know, procuring them and arms and ammunition to fight the war against Boko Haram cannot be justified because the soldiers are fighting without the necessary equipment. So you cannot separate the question of corruption you know, from the current state of insecurity in Africa. And irrespective of the number of arms and ammunition or foreign interventions that Africa seeks today, if we don't address the question of corruption, we may not be able to get out of the current state of insecurity in Africa. Let me bring in Jide uh, uh, here quickly. Jide, uh, uh, you know, it uh, looks like we're staying on this uh, uh, to see how we can start to map out uh, a possible solution. Uh, if you look at it across the continent, uh, in Ethiopia, in Cameroon, especially southern Cameroon, in Ghana, uh, you know, in the Horn of Africa, a uh, lot of places as highlighted, they have one thing in common, and it's, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the quest for power and not doing anything uh, for the people. Uh, and that is why we're talking about corruption. And as highlighted by both of you, the continent has, uh, you know, an abundance of human and, uh, you know, natural resources. So if that is the case, what are those key things the continent should be exploring now, especially in terms of leadership recruitment process uh, as we've seen so many in so many sit tight leaders across the continent. Exactly. Uh, you, you, I, I've been privileged to observe election in a number of African countries. Uh, I've, been, I've been to Egypt, I've been to Uganda. Uh, these are two countries. I've been to Ghana to also observe elections. And what I see. Um, is that yes, um, we, we, we have ritualized elections. Uh, look, look at uh, the strong man in Uganda, Yoweri Museveni has been there for over 30 years, about 35, 36 years now, uh, winning the last election. Um, at some point, there was a time limit, and then he removed the time limit. Look at what happened with uh, Kagame, who has been there for over a decade also removing the two-time limit to stay put in power. Ngwe Mambasogo has been there for over three decades. Uh, just next to us here in Africa is uh, Paul Bia, who has been there for maybe about 40 years or thereabouts. And, and quite unfortunately, uh, the, the, look, look at what happened even in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, the, the Alassane Qatara that, that the African Union had to help to reclaim his mandate from uh, Laurent Gbagbo uh, got there and didn't want to leave again. It is so unfortunate uh, that once uh, our African leaders get to power, they sit tight, believing that they possess the, no, the monopoly of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to resolve their issue. And this is in spite of the fact that many of these African countries actually have a five-year tenor, unlike Nigeria that has a four-year tenor uh, political system. So if in 10 years you cannot turn around the fortune of your country, what gives you uh, the, 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 the inkling that if you are there for 30 years, you will be able to do better? Because as is said by Lord Acting, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's what we have seen. Power for its own sake is what we have seen. And for me, Suleiman, the solution is very simple. Citizen action. We need to build critical mass of citizens that would demand for change. Look at the Arab Spring. If not for the Arab Spring, which is a mass movement, do you think we will still not have Osni Mubarak in power today? Will we not still have uh, the strong man in Tunisia, Bellomia, or what is his name? Do you think he will have left? That is the kind of citizen action we need to, 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 to build. Build critical mass of people who will demand for accountability in governance. And accountability in governance is not about 
uh, how you spend your budget, how much you take as security vote. It goes beyond that. Accountability is about your campaign promises. What do you think campaign promises are saying? When you are running for your second time or first time or fifth time, these are the things you promise and you have not done them. Why have you not done them? Those are the kind of things that we need, we need to make our, our rulers uncomfortable. Look at what's playing out in Miami. Sustained pressure by the citizens of Miami, in spite of many killings that have taken place, extrajudicial killings, as a result of that protest. But they are not backing down. The citizens of Miami are not backing down. Look at what played out in India when the Indian farmers march on the streets of India demanding for, you know, reforms, agricultural reforms, because of the policy that the, the Indian government came and brought about that was going to affect the farmers. They went on the streets and protested. Unfortunately, in Nigeria, the culture of protest has been criminalized. Look at how the ESA's protest end, uh, ended last October. That was a turning point for Nigeria to reinvent itself. When the youth of this country demanded for political accountability, accountability from our police officers to say that, look, we have had enough of extrajudicial killings, we have had enough of police exploitation, we have had enough of police brutality. That was what was, what was actual. Unfortunately, the state weighed it and they messed up the whole thing. But then, we can only postpone those evil days. The only way out for me is not about those institutions that have been corrupted. Is it the parliament of African countries that is just mere rubber stamp? Is it the judiciary that must give verdict that favors the executive arm? Otherwise, they will be removed from office Look at the look, look at what uh, the revelations that uh, our former CJ, uh, Chief Justice of Nigeria, uh, Walter Onoge, came up with just last week about not being given fair hearing. And that's the number one law officer of Nigeria who was unceremoniously removed as a result of, you know, maybe permutations around the elections, around 2019 elections. But you see, we need to build that culture of resistance. And it's not just one individual, because if an individual does a solo uh, protest, it's not going to be effective. I chose the medium of media advocacy to express my own reservation about the injustices and inequities of this system. But some others, like Shawore, like several other activists, decided to pursue you know, street protest. But that in itself, that's why being guaranteed by Section 40 of Nigerian Constitution has been criminalized. Mm. We have been cowed. And that is why things still remain the way they are. So let me, let me bring in uh, uh, Olufemi so that uh, we can uh, wrap up on this. Uh, Olufemi, uh, is there a chance for partnership uh, without having control uh, by these foreign powers over uh, the continent? Well, in moving forward, of course, even the biggest of nations, the most prosperous of nations, have always had reason to partner with other countries, you know, in order to advance the course of their progress. But in our own case, what I think we must do as Africans is for us to begin to use the potentials that we have and to begin to bring to the fore our capacities in any negotiations, in any you know, agreement that we're moving into as a continent. Now, the African continent cannot continue to act as beggar nations. We cannot continue to act as those you know, nations pre-colonial area. Now, the country must begin to exhibit its potentials the country must begin to demonstrate its capacity in entering to agreement, agreement and bilateral relationship or whatever you want to call it. If we don't do that, these countries will continue to see us as the dumping grounds 
they will continue to see Africa as those countries that they could really, you know, turn around with, that they colonize those countries without potentials, without Africa is a country is a continent with potentials with a lot of mineral resources, with a lot of human resources, with a lot of natural resources. And we must begin to bring this to the fore in whatever you no know, relationship we are engaging ourselves in with all these, you know, Western authorities. If we don't do that and we continue to act, you know, as the school children waiting to be fed, I don't think we will we'll see any 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 outcome of change in the nearest future. So Africa must begin to demonstrate its capacity. Africa must begin to exhibit its potential. Africa must begin to let the world know what it is capable of doing or achieving using its human capacity and mineral natural resources, you know, as, as a bargaining you know, strength. If we don't do that, you know, the story may still remain the same. Well, that's a fine place for us to say thank you very much, Olufemi Lawson and uh, Gideo Ojo. Both of you have been, uh, you know, far too kind. As highlighted by both of you, Africa is the most blessed continent of the world, and there's no doubt about that. So what we make of these blessings is uh, the business of the entirety of the continent, especially its leaders. Uh, so Africa should own Africa. Uh, many thanks again for being such nice company, GD and Olufemi. It's another good day on the square. Uh, we'll be back again. As both of you have highlighted, we'll must be on this. So we'll be here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.